Hey, folks, this is Eric with Texas Show. I, uh, I'm excited. Right now I have uh, on the line a guest. His name is Michael Heiser. He's a scholar in the field of biblical studies in the ancient Near East. Uh, he has an M.A. in ancient history from the University of Pennsylvania, an M.A. in Hebrew studies, and a Ph.D. in Hebrew Bible and Semitic languages. Uh, he's got it all, and he's got a new book out called The Unseen Realm, Recovering the Supernatural Worldview of the Bible. Michael Heiser, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me, Eric. Uh, well, it's wonderful to have you. Tell us about this book, The Unseen Realm, Recovering the Supernatural Worldview of the Bible. I love the idea. Yeah, well, I'm arguing for some simple things in the book, but they're simple, but, you know, yet kind of disturbing or profound is the word I like, but the truth is that people get disturbed. <laughs> hey, that's their, and, and that is, that's their problem, man. Yeah, yeah, well, that's, you know, ditto. <laughs> that's kind of been my attitude toward the whole thing. Yeah. I guess just to, to sort of simplify it, you know, uh, Christians and, you know, people who have a high regard for the Bible in any context like to talk about interpreting the Bible in context. Right. You know, that happens a lot. And what they usually mean is a literary unit or genre or something like that. But the most fundamental context is the one they omit, the one they seemingly never think about, and that is the ancient Near Eastern worldview. So my contention in the book is, look, the right context for interpreting the Bible, for understanding its story, its meta narrative, is not the Reformation. It's not evangelicalism. It's not Catholicism. It's not, you know, modern Judaism. The right context for interpreting the Bible is the context that produced the thing, which is really, really old and really, really foreign and really, really strange to the modern ear. Uh, the people who wrote Scripture and their original audience were predisposed to a supernaturalistic worldview that we no longer have. Even even confessing Christians, you know, we, okay, there's God, there's Trinity, there's the deity of Jesus, there's Satan, maybe, there's angels and demons, maybe, but that's pretty much where we draw the line, and it's a, it's a terribly overly simplistic view, and even though Christians will tend to embrace, for the most part, those ideas, there are many, there are myriad strange passages in the Bible that I'm trying to argue are really important. They have a role to play in the telling of the supernatural epic of Scripture, and they either get summarily ignored or we bring out the academic SWAT teams to try to rationalize them away. Well, the, the, to... the irony, I've, I've bumped into this. I mean, when I uh, became a Christian um, seriously in 1988, I wanted mm -hmm. whatever comes with the program, you know, like give, give me the whole thing, pay one price, <laughs> And it all comes, and it's all free. As much, it, I want everything. And I was amazed when I then bumped into Christians who said, oh, I don't know about that miraculous stuff, or I don't know about this, or I don't know about that. I thought, what, what, do, you, what do you mean you, you don't know? And <laughs> when I wrote my book about miracles, yeah. I was astounded to bump into Christians who were uncomfortable with a lot of what I wrote about. I thought, that's so bizarre. I mean, you're supposed, yeah. to, you're supposed to understand this stuff or be open to it. But they're very – I think that, that really to sum it up, but I want to get to the much more interesting stuff that you've written about in the book. But to sum it up, many Christians have adopted an Enlightenment rationalist view yep. of the world. They, they, yep. they have ironically reduced everything. They've taken, out of, taken it out of this holistic – uh, realm and and brought it down into a bunch of theological tenets and uh, mm -hmm. that's about it and and they're they're really missing the the life the life has been beaten out of things and everything is a thin breaded veal cutlet okay so in yeah your, I I agree in, in you agree that it's a thin breaded uh, veal cutlet yeah the, the believing church is really bending under the weight of its own rationalism yeah you know, oh I, there's when, no when doubt I run into scholars that that don't you know, they, well, you know, Mike, you can't say this, you can't say that. It's like, okay, well, now what I, what I need you to do for me is I need you to prove to me that the biblical writers and the audience that they're writing to were products of the Enlightenment. They were modern. Like I mean, it's, it's even, it's hilarious. But let, let, let's, let's get to the juicy stuff. You've got some amazing stuff in this book. Again, the book is The Unseen Realm, uh, Recovering the Supernatural Worldview of the Bible by Michael Heiser. Uh, Michael, you have... Uh, 
incredible things. You, I want to ask you this question uh, to tee you up. How did the descendants of the Nephilim survive the flood? Tell us, first of all, who are the Nephilim for those who are just tuning in? Yeah, the Nephilim are, according to Genesis 6, 1 through 4, passages like Numbers 13, 32, and 33, they are the offspring of the sons of God, okay, divine beings. So there's two ways to read Genesis 6 that, in my mind, honor a supernaturalistic worldview. One is the literal uh, perspective where you have divine beings assuming human flesh. They cohabit with you know, women, and then their offspring are a little bit different, okay, the Nephilim, uh, unusually tall for the, for the context. Uh, of the day. Unusually so tall. I mean, it's look, yeah. it's bizarre stuff. This is the kind of stuff that when you read the Bible, you're like, what the heck is this? This yeah, is people wacky. People don't realize that it's not just Nephilim that are described this way. For instance, in, in, the, in the conquest narratives in Deuteronomy 2 and 3, you've got Amim, Zamzumim, you know, Rephaim, Anakim, you've got all these, these terms. And even, even the term Amorite can occasionally be used, as in Amos uh, chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, to describe the occupants of the land, or at least a subset of them. That's my view. Uh, a subset of them as unusually tall, uh, taller than the average you know, person. And we can, we can get into how tall I think they were if we want to, but... The second way to look at this is that if you if you think back to the Abraham and Sarah story, yeah. when Israel is started as a as a people, there's some sort of supernatural intervention. You know, God enables Sarah to have a child when she's barren and, and well past age. We're not told what that something was. So you could read Genesis six one through four uh, in that way that somehow. You have rival gods, and again, a, a lot of the book is, you know, I'm saying when, when the Bible says that Yahweh, the God of Israel, is the God of gods, it means exactly what it says. There are other Elohim, because Scripture says that. Okay, there are now, lesser, but, but, there but, are lesser but, beings. But hang on, so sure. when you say there are other Elohim, there are other gods, we translate it the word gods. Yeah. yeah. Um, in the New Testament, when Jesus says, you, you know, have you not read that you are gods, I mean, he uses... Yep. He, he's quoting that, but of course we have it in the Greek, but it's the same thing, right? He's saying yep. that— He's quoting Psalm 82, verse 6. And he's saying we are God, small g. What, what, well, he's, what does that's he That's not exactly what he says. <laughs> what, what, is he, what is he saying? How do you see that? Okay, in that scene, in that scene, Jesus has just said in verse—this is John ten thirty, I and the Father are one. Okay, and then the, the, the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, get, get torqued at him which is understandable. And so he defends himself by quoting Psalm 82, verse 6, which is really odd, because it sa he says, doesn't it say in your own scripture, you know, fellows, that, you know, I said you are gods? Now, many scholars, I would say even most, especially if you're New Testament scholar, would say, well, Jesus is, is saying that, hey, all of us in the room here, you Pharisees and every, anybody listening, we're, we're all God, so don't get mad at me for saying I'm the Son of God. And, hey, how does that defend his deity? He's saying, quit picking on me, I'm just like you guys, and you're just like me. That's absurd. Okay, what he's actually doing is he's, he's taking Psalm 82 in context. In Psalm 82, verse 1, here's the key verse. It says, Elohim Nitzav Ba'adat El. A God takes his stand in the divine council. All right? Elohim there, familiar term for God. The next half of the verse says, in the midst of the gods, in the midst of the Elohim, the care of Elohim Yishpot, in the midst of the Elohim, he, the first God, the capital G God, passes judgment. Now, there, right there you have plural Elohim. You get down to verse 6 in the same psalm, and what do we see? We see God, the speaker of verse 1, saying to the group, I said, you are Elohim, you are God's, all of you, sons of the Most High. Now, unless there's another Most High running around in the Old Testament, other than, than Yahweh, what we have here is Elohim and sons of God being equated. Sons of God are Elohim. These are divine beings. It, it creeps us out because we are trained as Westerners. But uh, wait a we minute, I, I, but I'm, I'm, I'm confused. So we are, uh, because, of, be, because of God, we are gods. I mean, is, is that 
roughly— We're not talking about theosis here. We're, we're, okay, but how is it that sons of God are Elohim? You were just uh, explaining sure. uh, this difficult passage, John 10:30, 30, uh, which relates to the Psalms, when, when God says that the sons of God are— that in other words, we are the sons of God. We are Elohim. Somehow we are gods. What is it talking about? Right. Well, again, Jesus doesn't actually say that. He addresses his audience and says, you— Okay, doesn't, your, doesn't the Scripture say that you are gods? Now, the rabbinic community, many modern scholars say that what Jesus is saying is, hey, you guys, you're, you're gods too, just like me. I can, we can all use the same terminology. Again, right. that doesn't make any sense. How is that a defense of Jesus' deity in the passage? Because that's what he's defending. And it also doesn't make any sense of Psalm 82. You have a, a scene in the heavens, okay, Psalm 89 factors into this as well, where the council, the divine council was in the sky. It's just a term for the heavenly host. It's an academic term just for, you know, God among his host. And he says to them, you, plural, are all Elohim. You are sons of the Most High. So when Jesus quotes this passage, he's saying, look, don't rag on me for calling myself the Son of God and saying I and the Father are one, because your own Scripture teaches you that there are other non-human, i.e. supernatural beings, called sons of God. He's, what he's saying is, I am more than a man, and your own Scripture has this category. And then he follows that statement, that quotation of Psalm 82. Verse 6, he follows it a few verses later by saying, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Very obviously, the rest of the people in the room can't claim that. So th this notion that Psalm 82 is about humans being called Elohim. Okay, but then, what, what, but then what, what is he referring to? Then what are sons of God, and who are Elohim? Right. Uh, who, who are they? They are spiritual members of the heavenly host. Now, we use terms like angel which is problematic because there are lots of other terms. Angel is just a job description. It doesn't tell you ontologically what a thing is. Aren't, aren't seraphim and cherubim uh, and archangels More angels? More job descriptions. Right. An, an, a, an angel is, you know, a messenger. That's what the term means in both Hebrew and Greek. Cherubim and seraphim are throne guardians in the ancient Near East. These are the terms that would be used for them. Now, the ontological term is, in fact, Elohim. That's what all the members of the heavenly host are. Now, let me explain this. We're kind of creeped out by that because our Western minds, when we see the letters G, O, and D, or hear G, O, D, our minds just reflexively attach a specific set of unique attributes to that term. We think of Yahweh. Right. We think of omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresence, you know, all the traditional attributes, okay? Okay. But the biblical writer does not think of Elohim that way. How do we know? You know, should we just take Mike's word for it because he has a Ph.D.? No, please don't. Go concord. Go look up all the places where Elohim occurs. And here's what you'll find. I've done the work for you. The biblical writers use Elohim of half a dozen different entities. Now, if Elohim meant a specific set of unique attributes, they would never do that. Right. Because they do believe Yahweh is unique. I, I like to use the phrase, he's species unique. Well, we don't, we don't need to, biblical writer. I don't think we need to go further into this. It, the, I finally understand it, and I think this is extraordinary. Uh, I want to ask you another provocative question, uh, because this is what your book is about, this wonderful stuff. Um, why was Eve not surprised when the serpent spoke to her? Yeah, this goes back into what Eden really was in the ancient Israelite mind. There's a reason, for instance, that Eden is described as a lush garden. That's the, that's the, the description we typically think of, Genesis 3. But it's also described as a cosmic mountain in Ezekiel 28. Why garden? Why mountain? And Ezekiel also calls it a garden. Why, why do you have these two things? Because in the ancient Near Eastern mind, this is where gods dwelled. This, this was you know, sacred, you know, special place. The gods, of course, dwell in the best places. They dwell in paradise, not like us that are subsisting just to get by day by day. They dwell in mountains because they're remote, they're transcendent, that's different, that, that's away from humans, those icky humans, okay? This is the concept that the dwelling place of God was a unique, special place described as a lush garden or mountains. It's, it's just stock vocabulary. Right from the ancient world. And so because that's God's home, 
he, where, where he is, his entourage is, his heavenly host is, his, his panoply of, of supernatural right. servants. One of those is the, 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 you know, the job description it- throne guardian. Seraphim were serpentine in appearance. Okay, that's a, the term, it comes from an Egyptian term, seraph. Wait, I'm sorry, who, who, way, who was serpentine in, in appearance? The, the, the seraphim in Isaiah 6, they're, they're serpentine in appearance. And so when you get to Genesis 3, it's not surprise. It's not a surprise to Eve because she's living in Eden in, in God's house, so to speak, because that's where God created them to be. That's where God wants humans to be. She has seen these throne guardians, these beings that sort of look like, you know, serpentine you know, appearance or whatever, she has seen them come and go before because she dwells in the presence of God as well. Uh, Michael, some of this stuff is wild that you're saying, and of course, it's right there in the Bible, and so it shouldn't be wild or surprising. What you said about the seraphim, um, we think of them as angels, but you said these are throne guardians, the seraphim that we hear about all the time. Uh, you said that they are described as having something of a serpentine uh, appearance. I don't ever remember reading that. And what can that mean? Uh, when we think of an angel, we don't think of something with a serpentine exper- uh, appearance. Right. So, seraphim comes from Hebrew seraph, which is one of the nouns for serpent. And in Isaiah 6, again, I'm getting back to the Genesis 3 thing, why a serpent? Again, and the, and the short answer is because that's what throne guardians, that's one of the ways you would describe a divine throne guardian. And Eve has seen these guys before. That's why she's not surprised. This isn't her first time seeing one because she lives there with God. Now, you know, back to Isaiah 6, the vocabulary Isaiah uses, that he chooses, seraphim, not only in Hebrew can mean serpent, seraph, but it comes from an Egyptian term, seraph, which is sort of this cobra-like appearance. This is one of the ways that Egyptians in their culture described the guardians of Pharaoh. You know, the, again, these, the Pharaoh was viewed as a god on earth. And so in the iconography, there will be instances where his throne guardians, he's guarded by supernatural beings, you know, and this is the way they're portrayed. So it's stock vocabulary. What we need to do is we need to think of Eden as God's house or his temple, the place where, where he is. And he's there with his entourage, part of which are these throne guardians. And this, again, according to the vocabulary of Genesis 3, the term there is nachash, which means, again, a snake. That's the most obvious way to, to translate it. But interestingly enough, there are two other ways you could translate it without you know, geeking out on the Hebrew grammar here. Hanakash, definite article plus noun, serpent, that's easy. If, however, nakash is, is coming from a verb, it means the one who dispenses divine knowledge. And the, ser- the serpent in the story certainly does that. You could also translate it as the shining one if we take it as an adjective. I personally think that all of those things are going on. We have a luminous being. This is the stock way that a divine being is described throughout the Bible. He's certainly dispensing divine knowledge. And if we're, you know, picking up on the etymology, you know, or or at least the iconography, some of the familiar features of how divine throne guardians were described elsewhere in the Bible, then that would explain the appearance uh, of a snake. I mean, ancient people weren't stupid. They know that snakes don't talk. You, you, know, you can go to Egyptian literature, and when animals talk, people just know that what we have here isn't just a member of the animal kingdom. This is a god either come in disguise or a god that's obscured his, his appearance. There, there's something supernatural going on here. And so in the book, I talk about we need to get away from this notion, this overly literalistic notion that we're, we have a member of the animal kingdom here, and it once had legs, and God curses it, and its legs go away. You know, it, that isn't the point. It, the, the point is that we have a throne guardian, someone close to God's presence, that doesn't like humans, because humans are created as God's imagers, just like they were. Ha, has anyone else ever— And they don't like that. Has anyone else ever read this this way? Because this seems so new to me, what you're saying. Yeah, in the book, the, the dirty little secret about Unseen Realm is that nothing in the book is unique to Mike. Right. Okay, it, it, I am depending entirely on mountains of peer-reviewed literature. The, the, the best academic treatment on this would be Van Dyke's uh, book, 
on uh, Ezekiel's prophecy against Tyre. Again, it's a nuts and bolts who can scholarly forget, work. Who can forget Van Dyke's book? I, yeah, okay, now let, let me ask you, uh, there's another thing. We've just got a few moments here. Um, you, you, um, you answer the question, who are the glorious ones that even angels dare not rebuke? Uh, where's that from in the Scripture? Yeah, that, that's going to be a, a passage in, you, have, you actually have two different passages that, that are important for getting into this. You have one in Jude, and then you have one in Second Peter. So in Jude, the, the, Jude's talking about false teachers and whatnot, and he compares, um, you know, he, he uses this language of the glorious ones and the, and the archangels and whatnot, basically a, a higher authority. Uh, so if you compare Second Peter 2 and Jude, uh, Jude's only one chapter, but if you look at the treatment of false teachers there, you have this link between archangel terminology, Michael is the example in Jude, and the, the, the quote, celestial ones, the glorious ones. So what these passages show us is that there's, there's a hierarchical differentiation in the unseen realm that we sort of forget about and don't. Uh, really understand. Right. I personally think celestial ones does refer uh, to a, if you're getting into attributes, something more powerful than a mere angel, so, either so in terms of status. Would or the ability. term Elohim be fit there? In other words, are they described as Elohim? Yeah, I think Elohim is, is sort of a neutral term. What Elohim, a good synonym would be spirit being, spirit, in, quote, yeah. in Hebrew. Okay, and you would use the word Elohim if you were a biblical writer, and they do this at half a dozen different entities. You would use that word to tell the reader where that thing belongs. In other words, you're a resident, an inhabitant of the spiritual world. Right. Now, you can go on and describe hierarchy of Elohim. You can describe Yahweh as unique from the, all the other Elohim. I mean, basically, biblical writer's theology was this. Yahweh, the God of Israel, is one of the Elohim. But no other Elohim is him, period, exclamation point. Right. He is the only one that ever gets described as omniscient, omnipotent, the sovereign, the creator, all these things. That well, we I mean, he, he of course, I, 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 it is odd in a sense because he is, you know, you can't compare the creator of the universe and the creator of Correct. all of these creatures yeah, um, he made them. with the creatures, you know. Uh, the, yep. so, so God is apart from creation. Um, in a way that they're not. This they, is why, interestingly enough, there are passages that describe Yahweh as Ha Elohim, the Elohim. Yeah, in he's Hebrew. The dude. He is unique. It strikes me when we're talking about this unseen realm, all of these uh, fascinating spirit beings. Um, it reminds me of, I guess I should say, the only author uh, who I think has done this justice is C.S. Lewis. In his, in his space trilogy in particular, he seems to understand that there are these orders of spiritual beings, that there are uh, spirits that have given geograph been, been given geographical assignments, that there's, a, I mean, what does he call them, Eldils? But it's so fascinating mm -hmm. that, that he gets that, and it's a really full-throated view of things. Very few people seem to, to go there. Yeah, I, I think Lewis and Tolkien, let's just bring him in here, because and neither of them were Semitists, okay, but they were both experts in comparative mythology, okay? And again, I'm not saying that the Old Testament or the Bible is, is mythical, like fairy tale kind of stuff. We have to realize that when we talk about myth in this sense, uh, to, to steal Tolkien yeah, and, and a little bit of Lewis here. This is the myth that's true. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, we, we, we've got that going on. But since they were so tuned in to these sorts of motifs, I think it alerted them and made them better readers of the Bible, more perceptive readers. And then that comes out in, in what they write in, in, in various things, especially fiction. Um, but I think, you know, for the sake of, of your audience, we need to, I, I need to make a, so, sort of a clarifying point here. Unseen Realm is not just a book about angels and other spirit beings, Elohim and all that stuff. That's an integral part. What I'm trying to do in the book is I'm trying to relate how God's relationship to his heavenly host in all sorts of passages that we just gloss over or deliberately deny 
how that serves as a template for how God looks at us, our status, our participation with him here in this world, and our destiny. The, 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 the unseen realm essentially informs our reading of the whole epic story of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and how God is at work to restore his family. God wanted a blended family. He wanted a human family with his divine family. He wanted humans fit for dwelling in the divine presence. And, and when that's lost, God doesn't switch to plan B. He doesn't wipe the pieces off the board and go home. You know, he, he doesn't do that. He stays committed to the plan. And we learn about what he wants to do, how he views us, and what his purposes are, and what our purposes are. By analogy to a lot of this supernatural stuff that is sort of like a computer program running in the background of Scripture, it's odd to us because we don't come from that world. If you had a, I like to use this illustration. We all we all know what home Bible studies are. You know, we've all been in these things. You're sitting around in a circle. You're talking about a verse, and you go around the room. And hey, what does this mean to you? If you had an ancient Israelite in the room in your small group Bible study, when you got to that guy, his answer to what this passage means is probably going to freak you out. <laughs> it's going to be we're, something you have never heard before. And you know what? You need to you need to pay attention to him because he comes from that time and place. I we're going to have to leave it there. Just wonderful, Michael Heiser. Congratulations on the book, and thank you for being my guest. 